appreciate our brother. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Amen. I'm so happy to be here. This is my first time uh, to attend a Sunday service. I've been here before for another forum, but this is my first time to fellowship with us in the Sunday service. And I'm here with my family. Uh, I want to correct something. I'm not Humphrey, I'm Henry Monyoroku. And this is my best friend. She is Caroline Henry. And this young man here is Eden Imani. Yes, so maybe my wife can say just hi, then we there. Praise the Lord. Yeah, my name is Carol, and I love the Lord as my Savior. I'm glad to be here. And looking up to the Lord to be ministered unto. Thank you. Amen. We can appreciate them and they sit. Yes, she was in KU. I was in UN. Don't ask me how. <laughs> that is a story for another day. Uh, yeah, we were in a certain forum somewhere and someone, uh, I mean, almost all of us were from the University of Nairobi. So there is a brother who was from KU. So just to make sure that he kept the rhythm, he said um, so and so from the uh, University of Nairobi, Dikarud campus. So he meant KU. <laughs> <laughs> and, and somehow UN is a kind of mother to KU and other universities. So we thank God uh, that he has given us an opportunity to come together and hear his word. Uh, I'm also so happy to see my brother and friend, Peter, you are CMF. We have interacted in other forums, uh, and I'm so happy to see him. And also to see our elder, George Mwagi. When I was a first year student, I think, or maybe when I was beginning second year, he's the one who trained me in consistent Bible reading. And so I can assure you that, that you have the best trainer in CPR here. Amen? Amen? Yeah, so I got trained then, and from that time I've been a consistent Bible reader. Uh, I'm in the book of Psalms in my ninth round. And it's a blessing every day to hear from God as you open the scriptures and you hear God speak to you because He's a God who speaks. Amen? So, if you are here and you have not been part of that training, it is something I would highly recommend because that is the only way actually to grow in your Christian faith. So, I can see it's already nine, and so we better get started so that we can finish in good time. So, this morning we are talking about Christian Foundation. That is our topic today Christian Foundation. I'm going to give you a simple outline of what I'm going to share. We'll have an, a small introduction. Then we'll have another uh, aspect, uh, which I'm giving a title, No Other Foundation. Then from there we'll have a response. Uh, then from there, building on the foundation. Uh, foundation must be, right? So in the same way, in our Christian faith and experience, there must be a good foundation for us to live out a victorious Christian life, there must be a deep, a strong, and a firm foundation. One of the things you realize is that any person who is putting up a story building and does not spend good time and a good number of resources and materials in laying a proper foundation, what happens is that you can put up a very tall building and it might look very nice, but after some time, you start seeing some cracks. And some, sometimes you have seen even big, building, big, big buildings collapsing because there was no proper foundation that was laid. So that now when there is that weight of the whole building and the foundation cannot be able to support that, then the building cracks and collapses. And I realize that even in our Christian faith, when we don't work on the foundation and ensure that we are beginning on a good foundation, we might say, we, yes, we are in the Christian faith, and we are here in church, we are serving God, we are doing the things of God, but sometimes the storms of life come, 
then you realize a brother that you thought was still walking with God is no longer walking with God. And sometimes, most of the times, actually it's an issue of the foundation. So when we are talking about foundation, it's a very, it's a very interesting subject to think about. And I want us to go to the scripture, because I'm not here to give us stories, but to uh, give us the word of God. I want us to open 1 Corinthians chapter 3, which is a, one of our main scriptures, as we talk about no other foundation. And that subtitle of no other foundation. So 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 10 to verse 17. One of the things as you open scripture, you realize that the Corinthian church was a very confused church. And uh, it's because of a number of things I believe you've encountered in your Bible reading. And there is something God speaking through Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 3 verse 10 to 17 uh, he addresses. He's talking about the body of Christ as a building. And remember when we were, we were beginning, we said that when we are thinking about foundation, thinking about a building, a structure, a house, it is good to understand it from that perspective. He says, verse 10 of chapter 3, According to the grace of God given to me, like a skilled master builder, I laid a foundation, and someone else is building upon it. Let each one take care of how he builds upon it. For no one can lay a foundation other than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now, if anyone builds on the foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, straw, each one's work will become manifest, for the day will disclose it, because it will be revealed by fire. And the fire will test what sort of work each one has done. Verse 14. If the work anyone has built on, on the foundation survives, he will receive a reward. And if anyone, anyone's work is burned up, he will suffer loss, though he himself will be saved, but only as, as through fire. Do you not know that you are God's temple and that God's spirit dwells in you? If anyone destroys God's temple, God will destroy him. For God's temple is holy, and you are that temple. That is up to verse 17. So, of course, the context, there was a lot of strife and confusion and fights in church. And Paul, uh, uh, through the help of the Spirit of God, tried to address, uh, address some of the things that them. That when he came to them and preached the gospel, that he is actually the one who laid that foundation. And in verse 11, he helps us to understand what that foundation is. And he says that no one can lay any, any other foundation other than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. So speaking to the Corinthian church, he uses that image of a building to describe the body of Christ there. And he helps them to appreciate that actually the foundation of their faith is Jesus and Jesus Christ alone. Amen. And, and uh, as you think about the picture of a building, I also want us to open another scripture. First Peter chapter 2, verse 4 to verse 8. As you think about the picture of a building or a house, a temple, a building. First Peter chapter 2, verse 4 to verse 8. God speaking through our brother Peter says, Are you there? As a good Bible reader, you should open quite fast. You know where Peter is. It's not between Genesis and Malachi, yeah? Yes, it is towards Revelation. First Peter 2, chapter, uh, 2 verse 4 to verse 8. Our brother says, As you come to him, the living stone, that is Jesus Christ, of course, rejected by humans, but chosen by God and precious to him, you also, now speaking to the believers, you also, like living stones, are being built up into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For in, for in scripture it says, See, I lay a stone in Zion, a chosen and precious cornerstone, and the one who trusts in him will never be put to shame. Now, to you who believe, this stone is precious. But to those who do not believe, the stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. Verse 8. And a stone that causes people to stumble 
and a rock that makes them fall. So God, speaking here through Peter, helps the believers to appreciate that as a body of Christ, we are being built up into a spiritual house. And the foundation, the cornerstone, is Jesus Christ. Because as he begins there, he's talking about the living stone, which was rejected by men, but chosen by God and precious to him. That is Jesus Christ. He is the cornerstone. He is the foundation. And now the believers are being built up into that house, into that spiritual house. So that me and you, we are in those stones that have to be put together until this building is, I mean, it looks like the way it looks, a complete thing. So Jesus is the foundation and the cornerstone and the believers are those stones that make up that spiritual house. Are we together? So that coming back also to what Paul is saying in the first Timothy, he is telling them that there is no other foundation except Jesus Christ. And one of the things you appreciate is that Paul was careful to help the believers in Corinth appreciate that Jesus was their only foundation and there is no other thing, there is no other foundation that needed to be laid except Jesus and him having been crucified. And this is important for us. We are not Corinthians, yes, but scripture is very much to us today because it is good for you and me to ask ourselves what is the foundation of what we believe? What is the foundation of what you profess? Yes, you say you are Christian, but what is it that your faith is based on? I, I, I mean, if it was not COVID era, I would have asked you to engage your neighbor and ask them, when did they become a Christian? And number two, how did they become a Christian? And maybe number three, what even drew them to the Christian faith? Because the, the reason why that is important is because there are so many people who are in church today, they are even serving God through different platforms. But the foundation of what makes them say what they say and do what they do is not Jesus Christ, it is something else. Especially in our day and time, when there is another gospel that is being preached. So that you are having people who are coming to church, and they are so committed in church, and they are serving God the best way they know, but it is not because they, are, they want to seek and serve God for who He is. Some people came to faith because they wanted good grades. All of us were in high school at some point. And maybe a preacher came over the weekend and preached very powerfully and told you, you know, and, and you know, I, I know most of us here in evangelistic teams. Cindy, hello. hello. You are in evangelistic teams. And the minute you get into a high school and you say, I'm from the University of Eldoret, that enough. In a fact, you have a monophosy at Hogo and I say, well, I would rather listen to this guy. Just because you come from the university. Are we together? And I've seen, and some of us in our times of ignorance, we went and motivated students to come to the Christian faith so that they pass their exams. And so, so that you realize there are so many students who get born again towards KCP, towards KCSE. You know, they get born again in quotes. <laughs> they are coming to faith so that they get good grades. Others are coming to faith or are coming you know, to the Christian faith and community because they want some blessings. They are told, come to Jesus and Jesus will sort all your problems. He will heal all your diseases. He will take care of your family. He will give your husband and, 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 or wife or, and children and houses and careers and jobs. So there are people who are coming to the Christian faith or to the Christian community not because they want Jesus, but because they want some goodies from Jesus. Are you together? Hello? So that in a sense, we have changed the scripture in Matthew chapter 6 verse, is it verse 33? That says, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. 
and all these things will be added to you. Eh? Now there is a gospel that is being preached that seeks first the kingdom of God and his righteousness so that these things will be added to you. Do you get the difference? Yes. And and so, those who are good in, in grammar, they can tell us uh, what that means. Eh? I don't know whether that's the conjunction or what is it. But the point is, there are people who come to Jesus, not because they want Jesus, but because they want some other things from Jesus. And so we need to ask ourselves, then why is Jesus Christ so central in the Christian faith? Why is Jesus Christ the only foundation? And I want us to open 1 Corinthians 15, verse 1 to 4. Paul speaking to the same Corinthian church. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 4. Of what they base their faith in. 1 Corinthians 15, 1 to 4. He says, Now, brothers and sisters, I want to remind you of the gospel I preached to you, which you received, and on which you have taken your stand. I love that. The gospel that I preached to you, and you received it, and it is on that gospel that you have taken your stand. It, you know, it, it, is, it is a base. It is a foundation. Verse 2, by this gospel you are saved. If you hold firmly to the word I preach to you, and I love that last phrase in that verse 2, otherwise you have believed in the vain. So as he's telling the Corinthians, it is the gospel that I preach to you, and you received it, and actually you are taking your stand. It is from that, you know, it's from that base that actually you are standing. It is from that foundation that you are standing. And otherwise, if this is not the case, then your faith is in vain. Verse 3, For what I received, I passed on to you as of first importance, that Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures, that he was buried, and that he was raised on the third day, according to the scriptures. So that is the gospel that Paul preached to the Corinthians. He preached to them about Jesus. That is the content. That was the content of the gospel. He preached to them that Jesus Christ actually came and died for their sins according to the scriptures. And that he was buried, of course according to the scriptures, and he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures. You know, what he wants them to appreciate is that if Jesus Christ did not come and die on that cross, then their faith was futile. You know, coming to church, doing all those things, and there was no Christ that was crucified on a cross, their faith was futile. If that Jesus was not buried, then their faith was in vain. If he was not raised from that tomb on the third day, then what Maybe they had believed it was useless, if it is not that. Hello? So that he is reminding them of the gospel. And, and this is important, both, you know, the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus is a very central message in the Christian faith. So he tells them the gospel is that Jesus Christ died for their sins according to the scriptures. He was buried and was raised on the third day according to the scriptures. So if Jesus did not die, then there was no atonement for their sins. There is no way they would be forgiven of their sins. There is no way that they would be reconciled to God. There is no way that they would be justified. There was, there was no possibility outside the cross. And the burial and the resurrection are as important because if our Christian faith and experience is just about here and now, then it is also useless. If we don't believe that yes, we might die if Jesus dies, but when he comes back, we will be raised from the dead so that we join in, I mean, with him in eternal glory and enjoyment in his presence. So it is very important for you and me to ask ourselves, what grew us? To the Christian faith or to the Christian community? Is it that gospel about Jesus 
His death, his burial, and his resurrection, or is it something else? Because it is that what theologians call that Christ event, his coming, his death, his burial, his resurrection, and his ascension, that the theologians call all that the Christ event. So without the Christ event, then there is no redemption, there is no forgiveness of sins, there is no justification, there is no reconciliation to God. So Jesus, who we know that is the second person of the Trinity, he actually came to solve the greatest problem, I mean, in the human race, and that is sin. So that is the, the main problem that he came to address. Of course, the others are benefits that come around that. Because before the fall, you know, Adam and Eve were living in a perfect kind of environment. There was no sin, no thorns, no thistles, no pain, no suffering, no sicknesses. Before the fall of man, it was a perfect world, a perfect environment that God had set Adam and Eve to enjoy. But when that rebellion came in Genesis chapter 3, it meant man's relationship to God, man's relationship to one another, and man's relationship to the environment. It messed everything. So Jesus' coming was to come and address the greatest problem in the human race, and that is the problem of sin. Bible says in Isaiah 59 verse 1 and verse 2, that it is not that the ears of God are dull to hear us, and it is not that his arm is short to say, but our sins are the ones that separate us from him. So sin is the greatest problem that man has. And it's very good for you as a Christian to be, I mean to know that and to appreciate that. Because the world around us, they would want us to think that they are, you know, there are so many problems yes, in the world, and maybe the greatest problem they think is poverty, is sickness, is literacy, and so many things. But as a Christian, we must appreciate that the greatest problem man has is sin. And so, I'll ask us again, so, why did you come to the faith? What is the basis of what you believe? Is it Jesus and his death his burial and his resurrection to secure your forgiveness, your redemption, you know, your reconciliation to God, your justification, is that what in the forms what you believe? That is a question we must ask ourselves. And the reason why thinking about that foundation is important is because if we ignore that, then we have so many challenges in how we live our Christian life. We shall say that the foundation is important because how you begin your Christian journey influences how you progress. So that is the same thing if you are from here, uh, together with my wife we recited Kikuyu, Kikuyu Kiapu. We reach out to students, especially in Kikuyu campus of University of Nairobi and other high schools and colleges that are out there. If I want to go back to Kikuyu and I take a wrong direction, so that instead of moving towards Nairobi, I take a different route altogether. Yes, I can somehow try to navigate and get my way to Nairobi. But if I start on the right path, the right direction, then I'm likely to have a very good and an enjoyable experience and journey. And it's the same way, how you begin your Christian faith or your experience, it affects how you progress in it. So many people, they struggle in their Christian faith and experience because their foundation was shaken. That is why most people are struggling with their Christian faith. Their foundation is very shaken, or was very shaken. So that now, you, you, you find a Christian, maybe who, you are here in campus, and we know our public universities, may God have mercy on us. Someone said that it is so easy to begin. But actually to finish and graduate is another story altogether. I don't know about the University of Eldoret, but from where I was coming from, I knew that is actually a reality. Uh, and um, it, it is possible that uh, once in a while you might get a lecturer who is not very godly. 
I remember when I was in that year, there is a lecturer who would come. It is your first lesson in that semester. And he just looks at you and says, half of you, we will be together with you next year. How of you to Tapatana next year? So that means he has determined to make you fail, and actually you see him next year. I mean, it's so sad, right? It's so sad. And may God have mercy on our lecturers and help them to do their work diligently. Amen? Amen. <coughs> so what I mean is, I mean, because we are in a sinful world, and I, I hope this doesn't happen to any of you, but assume one of us maybe fails in a certain unit. Whether maybe you did not study diligently or something happened with such a lecturer and he gave you a knee not because you failed but because, uh, you know, other things that all of us know. How would be your response to that? Because you can find a Christian who is asking, God, where are you? I have served you. I am living for you. Why is this happening? Why am I getting a retake? So then the question you need to ask yourself why did you come to Jesus? Did you come to him so that he just gives you good grades and, and a very smooth you know, journey in campus and your career and profession? You see, because we're in a foreign world, we have challenges here and there. I pray that they don't happen <laughs> to any of us, especially in campus. But some of these things happen. I, I recently we were trying to work with a student who has been frustrated by you know, lecturers. You know, not because she has failed, but just because the lecturer has an interest and ensures that, you know, a girl doesn't actually pass her exams until maybe she complies to what he wants. And may God have mercy. But the, the, the question is, when we experience challenges in life, how do we respond to that? Most people, their response is informed by their foundation. So that if you came to Jesus so that he makes your life good, and now life doesn't seem to be very smooth, then you can actually even question Jesus. Do you even, I mean, are you even there when I'm going through these challenges? They are struggling in their Christian life because their foundation was not Jesus Christ and his finished work on the cross. The foundation of what they believe was on something else, not Jesus and him crucified. So a true Christian faith and experience must be founded on the gospel of Jesus Christ. His coming, his death, his burial, his resurrection, and you know, his ascension. So that is what informs or becomes a proper foundation for the Christian faith and experience. And I must say that if, if that is not what your faith is founded on, then I'll say like Paul in 1 Corinthians 15, then your faith is futile. If the foundation of what you believe and profess is not Jesus and Him dying on that cross to secure your forgiveness and redemption and to make you, you know, be able to approach God, if that is not the foundation of what you believe, then your faith is still tired. Hello? So it is good for us to remind ourselves of the gospel. The other, the other thing I want to talk about is now the response. In my abstract, I told you that we're going to have introduction. Then we look at no other foundation. Then the other aspect we want us to talk about is response. When we hear and when we understand the gospel as is clearly communicated in, in the word of God, that kind of gospel proclamation demands a response. And I think I, I love the way when, you know, during Pentecost, uh, in Acts chapter 2, when Peter preached in the power of the Holy Spirit, you know, and, and it's, it's, it's very interesting when you look at the life of Peter, but that is for another day. But when you see him starting and trying to address a very big congregation, when they were thinking that the guys were drunk and stuff like that, he preached the gospel to them. In Acts chapter 2, it's a very long chapter, we don't have time to read all that. But Peter preached the gospel to them. And can we open chapter 2, verse 37? When he preached the gospel to them, one thing I love about that is that they, they, they did a, an altar call for themselves. It is not the preacher who did the altar call. And maybe this is a good lesson for those who love preaching like me. 
you know, you know, Peter is preaching and they are the ones conducting the altar call, eh? the congregation. In Acts chapter 2, verse 37, after that gospel are hearing, verse 37 says, when the people heard this, they were cut to the heart. That means the message that Peter was preaching, you know, came with conviction. So, they were cut to the heart. And Peter said to their, sorry, and, and, and said to Peter and the apostles, so the people are the ones responding to the gospel. And they are saying, brothers, what shall we do? So yes, we have heard that that same Jesus that we crucified on that cross was meant to bring our salvation, was meant to reconcile us to God. So what shall we do about it? And I love verse 38 and verse 39. Peter replied, verse 38 of chapter 2, Repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And he says, the promises for you and for your children and for all who are far off, for all whom the Lord our God will call. So after the way the people respond and they ask him, what shall we do about it? So they have believed what actually Peter was saying and that's why they are convicted. They are, the message comes to their heart. And so they ask him, what shall we do? And Peter replies and tells them a number of things that we can note. Repent of your sins. Turn away from your sins. Number two, be baptized. And here he is talking about baptism in water. Be dipped in water. And he is in the, I mean, be baptized each of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, which is the first gospel, you know, promise that we actually, uh, our gospel promise and blessing that we receive by coming to faith in Jesus Christ, our sins are forgiven. And he tells them, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And he says, this promise is for you, for your children, and for all those who are far off. I'll mention something about that uh, uh, at some point. So, when we hear the gospel, being preached to us about Jesus, his life, his death, his burial, and his resurrection, the kind of response that ought to happen is for a sinner to repent of their sins, to turn away from their sins, to believe in Jesus, to be baptized in water, and, and, and baptism here is, is baptism in water, and baptism by immersion. Eh? That is the only Christian baptism we have. Eh? Immersion in water, enough water to bury you. Eh? I know I'm not talking about baptism, but it is good to clarify that. Baptism in water, fully immersed or plunged in water and coming out of that water. That is the baptism he's talking about. The reason I'm, I'm saying that, and this is for people who have heard the gospel, they have believed in Jesus, they are turning away from sins. Those are the people who are baptized. The reason why I want to mention something about that is because many people have used verse 39, the promises for you and for your children to qualify infant baptism. <laughs> I mean, I am not even a student of grammar, but I understand this verse plainly. It says that this promise that those who hear the gospel, they believe in Jesus, they turn away from their sins, they are baptized in water, they will receive the Holy Spirit. That promise is for you, for children who will hear the gospel and turn away from sin, for Gentiles who are far off, who will hear the gospel, turn away from their sins, believe in Jesus, and, 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 and actually get baptized. They will receive the Holy Spirit. It's a promise for all who respond to the gospel uh, as, as we ought to in the Bible. And, and, and I also thought about Hebrews chapter 6, verse 1 and 2. Uh, I realized that the writer of Hebrews, I think it's Paul, that uh, he says in Hebrews chapter chapter 6, verse 1 and 2, he talks about a foundational response. That when we hear the gospel, which is the foundation, there is a certain foundational response that ought to come with it. He says in verse 1 and verse 2, Therefore, let us go on to perfection, towards perfection. Leaving behind the basic teaching about Christ. And remember, Christ is the foundation. So, it, you know, it's, it's the base. Leaving behind the basic teaching about Christ 
and not laying again the foundation, which is repentance from dead works, faith towards God, instructions about baptism, laying on of hands, resurrection from the dead, and eternal judgment. Actually, the, you know, the, the, the first thing that the writer of Hebrews is talking about is the same, same thing I'm seeing in the book of Acts, is what I'm seeing Paul talk about in the book of Corinthians. That the foundation is Jesus. And now when that foundation is clear, the kind of response that ought to come with it is that of repentance. And repentance is not just coming to God and saying, God, you know, I'm so sorry for all these things, and going away. Repentance is where you actually agree with God's truth, that you are wrong and he is right in what he says. You agree with God that you are wrong and he is right. Then you confess it with your mouth and tell God, yes, I'm sincerely sorry for this sin and for that sin and for that sin. And also where you turn away from that sin so that if I was doing this, and I love the gospel, when you read the gospel, and the gospel, so you realize Jesus, like the soldiers come to him. So he has to ask the gospel, how are we supposed to respond? And he says, you know, don't do outside what you are you're supposed to do. For the tax collectors, you know, don't mishandle people in taxation and stuff like that. So repentance is not only the aspect of agreeing with God about his truth and about your wrong, but about confessing with your mouth about those specific sins, but also turning away from those deeds, I mean from those deeds that are actually uh, not in accordance to God's will. So that is what repentance is. And, and faith, he says in Hebrews, Hebrews 6, the one we have read, repentance from dead works and faith towards God. Trusting in God. Trusting in God for your salvation, for your forgiveness and in Him alone. And trusting in Jesus and what He has done on the cross to avail your salvation. Trusting in Him as a person. Not just trusting about what you have heard about Jesus, but putting or placing your faith in Jesus. Then he talks about baptisms, uh, he talks about the laying on of hands, which there is to include the baptism in the water and also the baptism in the Holy Spirit. And again he talks about the resurrection from the dead and eternal judgment. Those are foundational teachings, foundational aspects of our Christian faith, if we want to understand. So, so that there are those, at least the list I see here, the list I see in Acts, and there is those four aspects of trusting in Jesus, believing in Jesus and what he has done. Then there is the aspect of turning away from sin, repenting of your sins towards God. And there is the aspect of being dipped in water. And there is the aspect of being baptized or being filled by the Holy Spirit. And that is how we see people beginning their Christian faith. They hear the gospel about Jesus. Then when they hear that gospel, they respond to that gospel by believing in Jesus, turning away from sin, you know, being baptized in water and being baptized in the Holy Spirit. That is how we see, especially when you read the book of Acts, that is the kind of a pattern that you see. People hear the gospel, they believe in Jesus, they repent of their sins, they are baptized in water, they are baptized in the Holy Spirit, or they are filled by the Holy Spirit. So again, back to where we started, how did you begin your Christian faith? Did you hear the gospel about Jesus Christ? Or did you hear another gospel of come to Jesus and he will sort out all your issues? Did you hear the gospel about Jesus Christ and his death, his burial, his resurrection? And after hearing that gospel, did you respond by placing your faith in Jesus, turning away from your sin, being baptized in water and being baptized in the Holy Spirit or being filled by the Holy Spirit, is that your experience? Because if that is not how you came to faith, then there could be some issues with the foundation. And you might struggle in your Christian experience because the foundation was, was having a, a few issues here and there. Hello? So just take a minute and ask yourself, brother, how did I become a Christian? Did I even hear the gospel about Jesus? Or did I just see people going to church, singing to God, giving, you know, going for missions, and I decided, I think this sounds like a good community I want to be part of. So 
ask yourself, did you hear the gospel about Jesus? And did you respond to that gospel by trusting in Jesus, by turning away from your sins, by being baptized in water, and by being baptized in the Holy Spirit? Is that your experience? Because if it is not, then we, you better, you better have, have it right, so that as you begin your Christian experience, you are actually starting on a good foundation. Especially one of the things I observe in among Christians and in church today, you have so many people in church who profess to be Christians who have actually not really believed in Jesus. They have just believed about Jesus. They have believed that, yes, I believe he came, he died on me, I am on the cross for my life and stuff like that. But really, they have not placed their faith in Jesus. They don't call unto Jesus to save them and to help, I mean, to help them in their Christian life. We have people in church who did not begin by repentance and they are actually not repenting. Because it doesn't mean that when you repent, you know, as you begin your Christian life, that that is the end of your repentance. No. Actually, you realize that the better you become, I mean, the better, the better you become informed about God and who you are in God, the, the greater you grow in your repentance. You are now more sensitive to, to even small mistakes that you do that you know they are not in line with God's will. And you are able to turn to God and ask Him for forgiveness. Thank you. Are you that kind of a person who is growing in your repentance? That when you realize that you have missed the mark, you quickly turn to God and ask Him for mercy. Because that is how you begin and that is how you continue. Okay? You begin by placing your faith in Jesus and you continue by trusting in that Jesus every day. So again I see Christians or people who are in church, so many of us, but we are not actually baptized in water. And I don't see that in the book of Acts. Actually what I see in the book of Acts, someone believes in the gospel and repents of their sin, the next thing you hear they are dipped in water. Almost immediately. But I don't know why in our times that yes we hear the gospel and we respond yes by believing and repenting, but you realize you have, you have to go to a certain class first to, be, to know, uh, you know, to be taught about baptism. Of course it's because the gospel maybe was not clearly communicated. Because when it is clearly communicated, you should know that is actually that is part of how to respond, even to that gospel. And we also see so many people who do not have regard even for the Holy Spirit. They don't desire to be filled by the Holy Spirit every day and to walk in the ways of the Spirit. They, they are not keeping in step with the Spirit. So it is good to ask yourself, where are you in that? Building on that foundation before we come to a conclusion. <coughs> Building of the foundation. And I want us to open Matthew chapter 7, verse 24 to verse 27. Matthew 7, verse 24 to verse 27. This is how to build on the foundation. So that if you are sure the foundation is proper, then how do you build from there? Because it doesn't end there. If the people who are building this place, they just came and laid a good foundation and went home. I mean, we wouldn't be seated here. So, how do you build on that foundation? Jesus says from verse 24 of uh, Matthew 7, Therefore, anyone who hears these words of mine and puts them in practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain came down, the streets rose, and the wind blew and beat against that house, yet it did, not, it did not fall, because it had its foundation on the rock. But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them in practice is like a foolish man who built his house on, on sand. The rain came down, the streams rose, the wind blew and beat against that house, and it fell with a great crash. So what I see from Jesus' words is that yes, he is the foundation, actually Jesus is the rock. So, and now a man who hears Jesus' words and puts them in practice is now like a man who is building on that foundation. 
And the assurance I see there is that such a person who hears Jesus' words and puts them in practice, that person will never be shaken. Amen? That is what I see there. There are the, the streams will come, the winds, the storms, and all these things in life will come. But that Christian will never be shaken. Why? The foundation was Jesus, the rock. They are building on that foundation by hearing God's word and obeying it. Because it's not just about hearing God's word, but also obeying it that brings the transformation. That person will actually stand. But of course, in comparison, a man who does not hear God's word and put them in practice is like someone who built on, on, on sand and when these things came up, I mean the, the building fell with a great crash. And you don't want that to be your testimony. You want to be a kind. And, and I love a singer who says, who says, when we walk with the Lord in the light of his word, what a glory. Yeah? He says on our way, when we do his good will, he abides with us still. So the Christian life, how to build on that foundation is to hear God's word and obey it. And I love here the verse, that is Romans 12 verse 1. It's one of my favorite verses. That therefore, brothers and sisters, I urge you, you know, in view of God's mercy, and you see Romans, when he's coming to Romans chapter 12, from Romans chapter 1 verse 11, he has been talking about God's mercy and how he saved us, how he reconciled us, how he threw us to himself. So that in light of that mercy of God, then offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. And he says in verse 2, do not be transformed, sorry, do not conform to the patterns of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, his pleasing, and his perfect will. So you realize that how to grow or how to build up from that foundation primarily is by hearing, by reading, by studying, memorizing, meditating, and obeying on God's word. Amen. That now if the foundation is set, then how do you build up from there? Hear, read, study, memorize, meditate, and obey God's word every day. But also I see in Acts chapter 2 verse 41 and verse 42, a scripture that we read, uh, uh, but we read verse 38 to 39. Acts chapter 2 verse 41 and 42, it says, were baptized, and about 3,000 were added to their number that day. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, and to fellowship, and to breaking of bread, and to prayer. So that I see these early Christians in the book of Acts, how they built from that foundation of their Christian life is by devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching. Because the apostles' teaching, what we see at the letters in Acts, in you know, you know, uh, in the epistles, and, sorry, the letters in the epistles, uh, sorry, the letters which are the epistles, eh? <laughs> the apostles, what they taught, they were inspired from God. You know, as they taught and as they communicated the gospel. So the disciples, these early Christians, they are the disciples. They devoted themselves to, you know, to the teaching of the apostles and to fellowship. So I also see something that helps in the building up of this Christian faith is through fellowship. When we come together with other Christians, we fellowship, we share, we pray, we hear God's word together, we are accountable to one another, we walk with one another, that is how to grow, that is how to build. And also we see the aspect of breaking of bread and of prayer. So a Christian who is also being devoted in prayer, who is continuing in prayer, that person is building on the right foundation. So having begun the Christian faith on the only foundation that is Christ, one must continue building on that, uh, that foundation by daily intake of God's word, by fellowship with other Christians, by prayer, as they continue praying and trusting God, and even you know, sharing with other Christians. That is how to build on that foundation. And so it is good to check as I conclude. And then we can start.
Pakistan as we conclude. <clears throat> that as we ensure that there is a proper foundation of our faith, that we have the gospel about Jesus, not another gospel, but a go the gospel about Jesus, and we have responded to that gospel by placing our faith in Jesus, and we continue to do that every day. We started by repenting and we continue to repent. We were baptized in water. We were baptized in water. And so if you are here and you are not baptized, that is a foundational issue that you need to check. And the baptism in the Holy Spirit, have, have you been baptized in the Holy Spirit? Are you filled? And it is not a one-time experience again. It is just the way to begin. Then you go on being filled by the Holy Spirit. That is what we see in the book of Acts. It is not a one-time thing. It is a continuing feeling of the Holy Spirit to empower the Christian to live a victorious Christian life. So is that the gospel that you had? And is that the way you responded? So if then that is the case, continue. Go on building on that foundation. But again, if that is not how you came to Christ, then it is a good time to reflect and check whether actually your foundation is right. So that if it is not, you get up there. I mean, you better get it set Set out well so that you begin your Christian faith well. I initially had time, but now time, I have seen my time is up. I don't want another note, my time is up. But I would have loved if we had time to see this song by uh, Stuart Townsend and Keith Getty that says, In Christ alone. And he says, or they say, In Christ alone my hope is found. He is my light, my strength, my song. This cornerstone, this solid crowd, found through the fiercest drought and storm. What heights of love, what depths of peace, when fears are still, when striving cease. My comforter, my all in all, here, is, here in the love of Christ I stand. In Christ alone, who took on flesh, fullness of God in helpless babe, this gift of love and righteousness, scorned by the ones he came to save. Till on that cross, as Jesus died, the wrath of God was satisfied. For every sin on him was laid. Here in the death of Christ I live. There in the ground his body lay, light of the world by darkness lay. Then bursting forth in glorious day, up from the grave he rose again. And as he stands in victory, sin's curse has lost its grip on me. For I am his and he is mine, bought with the precious blood of Christ. No guilt in life. Romans chapter 8, verse 1. Those who have come to Christ, they have heard the gospel and they have responded right. They have no guilt. There is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. No guilt in life, no fear in death. This is the power of Christ in me. From life's first cry to final breath, Jesus commands my destiny. No power of hell, no scheme of man can ever pluck me from his hand. Till he returns or calls me home, here in the power of Christ I stand. Why don't you take a minute to respond to God in prayer, in what God has spoken to you as we bring this session to a close. We thank you, Jesus, that in Christ alone, in Christ and Him alone, and your finished work on the cross to save me, to reconcile me to God, there on that cross, the love of God was fully satisfied. And there you purchased our lives from sin, from death, from Satan, from the world. So God, what a great, what a great love that you have displayed to us through the gospel. We praise you in this morning. We thank you. We thank you, O God. We thank you that you are a good God. We thank you. That on that sure foundation of Jesus and Him alone, we cannot be shaken, we cannot be moved. We are able to stand strong on the mount of Jesus. Not in our strength, not in our wisdom, but only on the mount of Jesus. That's the thing of God. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for the gospel. Thank you for the gospel that, that teaches us that in Christ alone, we can fight for weakness, we can fight redemption, we can fight. Over the forgiveness of our sins. What a blessing is. What a peace is ours. We thank you, Lord. We praise you. In Jesus' name.
So I would ask that if you are here and you realize that yes, you are in a Christian community, but your life is not founded on the gospel of Jesus Christ, his death, his burial, his resurrection. If that is not the foundation of your faith, you can come to Jesus today, even this morning, because he is here with us. You can call unto him and he can hear you, he will save you. If your response to the gospel is not that of trusting in Jesus and repenting and turning away from your sins and baptizing in water and baptizing in the Holy Spirit, then today you can respond to God by placing your faith in him and turning away from your sins. And because we don't have time, after the service you can see me or even these leaders here and they can fellowship with you and help you to maybe to clarify the gospel to you and to respond aright. Let's pray. Our Father, we are so thankful for your great love towards us. That sinners like us who are far away from you, separated from you by our sins, you sent your son Jesus. Oh Lord, what manner of love is this that you have lavished upon us? That on account of Christ, we are forgiven. On account of Christ, we have been reconciled to God. That now we belong to God. Now we are yours and you are ours. What a blessedness, oh God. We thank you for this great love. And we pray that you help each one of us. Even each and every day, even for us who are Christians and who are working with you for some time. To continually be reminded of the gospel and to be refreshed by the gospel. Reminding us that it is on Christ and him alone. That actually we were drawn close to you, oh God. And we thank you. And we thank you that you've not left us alone like orphans, but you've given us your spirit who every day teaches us, reminds us of the truth of God's word, assures us of who we are in Christ. And we can go on living victorious Christian lives and serving you in different capacities as you call us, oh God. So we pray that you help us this morning even to respond with gratitude to you in thanking you for Jesus, in thanking you for the gospel that has come to us and that through that gospel we have come to faith in Christ. And we thank you, O oh God. Sisters, may you continue making the gospel clear to them and helping them to ensure that their Christian faith and experience is built on a proper foundation. Help them as they continue in their studies that you be gracious to them, that your favor be upon them as you grant them understanding of the things that they are learning and the skills that they are being equipped with so that they can serve humanity better. So be gracious to them and bless them in Jesus' holy name we pray. Amen.